complained about that question on the exam, and you're, you're spoon-fed every answer on that 25-point question in the you know, lecture immediately preceding the exam. So I don't know why you, you figured it was a hard question. Every answer in that set of 35 answers was given to you in the lecture just preceding the exam. If you don't believe it, go back and look at your notes. Um, can you catch these, Mark? <laughs> Oops, got a good man there. Okay, that first one on there. Uh, this morning we want to discuss for just a moment, uh, after we've discussed all these matters of trellis types and thetting methods and what have you, something on the time of pruning and its effect on the vine. And of course, we, you had this in your reading assignment, so it's just really a matter of briefly reviewing it. And uh, that is that in the past, the growers, in the past, I say uh, European growers and historically and so forth have felt that if you prune the vines uh, in the middle of the winter, that you're going to get a, that, put it the other way, that they felt that as the fall came on and you got dormancy, that carbohydrates actually migrated from the longer parts or the, the uh, terminal parts of canes back into the trunk. This type of thing goes on, of course, as you'll find out when you get into it, while the uh, leaves are on and they're producing carbohydrate because it's going into storage and into the trunk and into the root systems. But we feel that there's very little of this happens after the leaves fall off and you go into dormancy period. But as I've told you before, don't ever underestimate uh, comments made by growers who've been growing grapes for a thousand years on s something they observe. They may not know, understand the explanation, but they've got the observation. And uh, this feeling then in Europe was the idea that uh, the carbohydrates and so forth migrated back into the trunks, so forth, so you didn't want to prune too early for fear you might <coughs> cut off some of the sugar or carbo uh, sugar in this case migrating into the trunk. Well, uh, our, in recent years, we found out two explanations to uh, discredit this belief this belief that the carbohydrates move back into the storage area during the winter time. And one of them is this, is the <coughs> physiological phenomenon that, and where you have cold weather, that is uh, temperatures down to uh, close to freezing temperatures, let's say down to temperatures of zero to five degrees centigrade as is the case in, with potatoes, that if you store potatoes which are mainly, as you know, starch at zero to five degrees centigrade, you get a lot of the starch converting over to sugar. So this is one reason why at this, this temperature then, here, this is what you, way you'd write the formula, you get a lot of the starch going to sugar. And then if you have cool temperature, and this might be something above, let's say above, uh, above this, but let's say 15 to 20 degrees, which is close to outside temperature right now, then you might get the sugar going back to starch. This, I'm not sure, the, this, this is just given as an example. But this is uh, certainly an observed phenomenon in, in potatoes, as I say, and uh, it is also occurs in uh, vine tissue, canes tissue above ground level. That is, you go into the fall, you have this fairly high sugar content, but as you get colder and colder weather, you get more of the starch converting over to sugar. This may be uh, evolutionary, nature's evolutionary way of, of uh, ensuring the continuation of the species because as the starch, which is insoluble, goes into sugar, as I told you before, it should give you a little bit of antifreeze action to prevent uh, extreme cold injury. Well, you have this slide, I mean this figure, which I'm going to show you in the text. In fact, it's on page 250, in case you haven't got a text or haven't bothered to open it. Uh, so you can see that. This. And this is here, of course, what I want to point out is that this, which is not very well explained in the text, is really for whole cane analysis. That is, taking the whole cane like this and analyzing it for starch and sugar. Later on, we're going to break this down into discussions and discuss the, the uh, starch and sugar content in the bark and in the wood and so on. But these is whole cane tissue uh, in above ground, 
course, some above ground parts. And here, back here, and somebody duck a moment. Let's get this date. Okay, see, back here in November, if you back in November, analysis shows about 3% sugar and about 15% starch to give you a total of about 18 or so total. And then as you go into the colder and colder weather, you get this uh, cold weather effect on the enzyme relationship of starch to sugar, and more of the starch turns to sugar, and of course your starch decreases proportionally, and of course you should have uh, symmetrical curves in this case. Then back out in the spring, out here, and another month or so, the weather begins to warm up, and you get a decrease from sugar and a conversion back to starch. But then about another month or so later, when buds begin to push, you get a completely different phenomenon going on, in which, of course, is if you want the starch to move to the growing points of the tissue so that they're useful for energy, then that starch has to convert again back to sugar. So you get a high sugar content here in the middle of the winter in these canes, and then you get a relatively high sugar content, again, of something of 5 or 6 percent or more out here in the shoot tissue uh, in the, when the shoots are in that first 6 to 12 inches of growth because they have to have sugar in, from the mother plant in order to have energy to grow and they haven't had time to produce their own sugar. So you have those two high periods of sugar in the plant, in the uh, cane or shoot <coughs> tissue of the vine. So now we do have a test for a, a very qualitative uh, test which can be made for starch content which is produced by let's have the lights because we can leave this on for the moment we know it's on here which the starch test as those of you may have had organic chemistry know uh, you can take potassium iodide potassium iodide and put it in water uh, in water And then add, uh, and then add plus iodine crystals, I, I2 crystals, and you can make a solution, which really becomes a complex called Ki3. And this Ki3 solution, you can put a drop of that on any plant tissue, and if it contains starch, it will turn blue. So that if these uh, people who felt that the sugar was moving into the, back into the uh, trunk and into the roots of the uh, the plant in November and then uh, and tested it with an iodide test here and then tested with iodide test here, obviously they would show a qualitative difference in the amount of starch, less blue color. And they said, well, of course it's going into the plant. So they had some basis for thinking that, that the starch was moving into the plant. They just didn't know this cold weather effect on changing part of the starch into a sugar form and leaving it right where it was. So that was one basis perhaps for the belief. But the real proof, we can have that off now, please. Uh, the real proof of this came with, with Dr. Esau's work here at Davis, in which uh, she was one of our outstanding botanists or anatomists. They stole her way down to Santa Barbara. Uh, so she's at Santa Barbara now. I guess she's retired but this time. But uh, she showed in some of very beautiful, clear anatomical work and uh, some of you might be interested so I can give you the reference. By the way, many of these references, which I normally have required students in the past to read and put on, reser on reserve in our library, I'm trying to bypass with such a large class for a couple of reasons. We used to be able, when we had a class of about 30 students, to hand people out copies of the reprints of these things when, when we had quite a supply on hand and only had 25 or 30 students. But we've run out of those, so we're down to a reserve of about five or ten in most cases. And instead of handing out 20 or 25, we have to hand out 80. And we don't have the copies, so that means that we'd have to go Xerox uh, uh, 80 copies or 100 copies. And uh, I think that, and then, or put on just a five or ten on reserve in library. And if I put five or six or seven copies of a required reading on the library for 80 people to go over and fight for, it becomes a nightmare. <laughs> So in many ways, I'm trying to boil down the uh, main points out of a lot of what used to be required reading for you. So, but any of you who want references, when I refer to some of these things, if you want the real reference so that you can go look it up yourself or even spend the money and get the, the uh, 
uh, Xerox yourself, I'm perfectly, I'd be happy to give you the references to some of these things. But anyway, Dr. Esau, in her work of a uh, uh, very beautiful section work, found that, um, that the sieve tubes in the phloem tissue, uh, so you've got a cross section of stem here, and then on the outside, of course, you've, you've got uh, the cambium in here somewhere, and outside that you've got phloem, and on the inside of that you've got xylem, xylem tissue, and in this phloem tissue, in which most of the, your carbohydrate materials move, she found that the, the sieve tube elements, the sieve tube elements here, at the, at the, at the, these things under high microscope section, I'll show something like this and you'll have a plate across here and then another long cell here and another plate across here. And that normally, during the growing season, you have protoplasm, of course, lining these walls, and then you have sieve plates. And this is called a sieve plate. And it is a sieve, and it has a little connections that go through here that connect into your protoplasm and make a continuous uh, uh, conducting tissue for moving sugars and sugars and organic materials up and down in the plant. And she found that if you, in a, in a real careful study of this tissue over the whole season, that in the late fall when you go into dormancy, that there's callus forms over these, these areas and essentially blocks off each little individual cell element so that you can't get any movement of sugars from the terminal parts of a cane down into the, into the trunk and so on during the late fall and winter time because each one of these extremely microscopic areas is blocked off so that there's no movement then from this element into that element. And then in the spring, as, as we begin to get into normal growth activity, this, this callus material dissolves, dissolves away, and once again, you have the conducting tissues through these sieve plates. And this is quite a nice piece of work that she did to show this. And it, she goes through the whole annual cycle of a, of a cross section of stem as well as uh, emphasizing the sieve plate nature. Now, when I give this explanation, the students always, always confuse this with what we're talking about when we're out pruning grapevines and we've got these nodes where we have the buds and so on, and they think I'm talking about this diaphragm across here in a, in a cross section of a cane. I am not talking about this diaphragm in a cross section of a cane. I'm talking about the extremely microscopic cell out here in the phloem tissue, which is along out here just outside the cambium. These diaphragm, a diaphragm of this type is something else. This then is a diaphragm at a cane node. And it is not, has nothing whatsoever to do with what I'm talking about over here. But when I give a midterm, students invariably give me this, which it has nothing to do with. This is that thing I was telling you about that's one of the differences between vitis vinifera and vitis rotundifolia, where vitis rotundifolia doesn't have diaphragms. You have the pith going just down continuously. So don't get the two confused. Okay, so, so uh, there is no movement then after dormancy, after leaf fall and so forth of this material back into the trunk. So then the question is, well, then why worry about what time to prune it? And normally under our normal conditions here, right now we have no problem with this because you can usually start pruning uh, any time after the frost knocks the leaves off. I'll tell you that as a summary sentence to begin with. That is, that under practical conditions, you would normally, you could prune any time from the moment the frost knocks all the leaves off so you can see the canes, so go ahead and prune it. And if, you're, if you've got 20 acres that you're working on weekends, you might as well start pruning the first weekend after all the leaves are off. But uh, the reason this thing came up as a question was Dr. Wink was, was asked this question back during World War II when there was a shortage of labor and they wanted to do just that on large scale where they only had three or four workers. They wanted to know how soon they could possibly start to prune. And that's the basis for this table that you have on your, in your text on page 251. 
which you might look at. And he and he start, he worked there. I'm just going to give you just a, a, examples of the data because you can go look up the table yourself. And he worked with two varieties here at Davis, and he worked with Valapinus. Valapinus, and he pruned them on uh, September the 7th. This is 9-7 for foreign students. Remember, this is September 7th and uh, September 28th. And uh, we just need to go to October 7th here to illustrate this data. And I'm just going to show the bark, the bark analysis for uh, total carbohydrates. And in this course, we usually refer to total carbohydrates as CHO. The people over in botany have a fit when we tell them that we're using CHO to mean total carbohydrates, but anyway, we do. And uh, the analysis that he got there, when he pruned it September the 7th, he got 10.8%, 12.6%, and 13.2% when he pruned on September the 7th, or, the, or he pruned on pru September the 7th, but he, may, he took samples for analysis at each of these consecutive dates, as we show here. So that you see, he, if he pruned here on September the 7th, uh, he really pruned a little too early because they had not built up adequate reserves. And even when he pruned on September 28th, they still showed a little bit further increase after that. But beyond that, they were just more or less constant. Now, when he pruned on September the 7th, he had mature canes And more important, the grapes were 25-degree bowling, 25-degree bricks, 25-degree okay. bricks uh, berries, which means that they were fully, fully ripe berries. Now, that was the Valdepinus. The data he got for another variety, well, I wasn't going to show it, but I guess I should here because it has a little contrasting point. Now, he used St. Emilion. This is Uni Blanc, to those of you who may know it, or Trebbiano. It has, has three different names, but we call it St. Emilion. And on the same thing, he pruned on 9-7. And his sugar in, this, in the bark of the canes now, the bark of the canes, he had 9.8% on 9 uh, it doesn't make much difference in your notes, but I always like to have things a little bit right. That's not 928, I can't, it's 921. So if you want to mark that out. 921, he had 13.5%. Uh, and, and on 10.7, he had 15.5% carbohydrate, and then beyond that, the next couple of samplings were about the same. Now on this, uh, he had only 10% of the canes, only the basal 10% of the canes were mature. The basal, put it in here, basal 10% of the canes were mature, and the grapes were only 21 degree bricks on this deal. So that uh, uh, this, this was a situation that he got on carbohydrate maturity. And two things come out of this. First was that when he pruned on September the 7th, if you, if you recall thinking back what the weather's like September 7th, that's a month before school starts, it's still quite warm. And when he pruned on September the 7th, I've told you in class already, some of you that, uh, or not in class, but in the 5 p.m. sections, that you can sometimes stimulate new growth by a severe pruning if it hasn't gone too far into dormancy. So what he did by pruning on September the 7th, when they had not yet gone completely dormant, he stimulated many of the buds to break and start to grow so that he got something like uh, uh, 6 to 12 inches of growth out of many of the buds, which he did not want to break at all because they are next year's fruit buds. So if you prune that early while it's still warm and uh, the vines have not had time to go dormant, with that pruning wound close to uh, buds, you're liable to stimulate them into breaking and starting to grow. And then the final summary point is, which all this leads up to, is that 
you can prune if you want to. I said that the uh, practical deal to do is to wait until all the leaves are knocked off by frost so you can see the wood. But if you really want to, you can prune grapevines, in California at least, starting a month after you harvest, whether the frost has come or not. But you would not do it. See, this is roughly, this was at harvest time, of course, September 7th. But if you wait another month after you take the fruit off, then beyond that, and whether you're talking with either one of these two varieties, if you harvest them at a month after maturity, uh, that's in, in California, that's October 7th, and, you're, and by then the weather should be cool enough so that you should not get the stimulation of bud break, actual bud growth, and you've had a month after you took off the crop to uh, allow those leaves to put carbohydrate back into the wood, into the canes, rather than into the fruit. You've taken their dependence off by taking the crop off. Then you give them a month to uh, put all their carbohydrate into the canes. So two factors involved. Don't prune too soon because you might cause uh, an undesired bud break. And secondly, a rule of thumb is to wait a, a month after you take the fruit off before you prune. Well, you say, well, in, Cal in Davis, uh, both of those would apply anyway. But you take the fruit off in Coachella Valley in June. <laughs> you wouldn't want to prune the 1st of August. So you have to wait until it gets cool enough to, so that uh, you will not, by pruning, cause renewed bud break. Unless you're growing grapes in India or uh, uh, some of these uh, um, near tropical countries where they actually use a, a combination of drought and pruning to break the dormancy, to break the dormancy so that they get two crops in the same year one small crop and one big crop. But this is not a point to discuss here. We can discuss it at 5 p.m. But under our California conditions then, uh, you would wait until uh, the weather is cool enough so that you would not get renewed uh, growth from a pruning shock that you would give to the buds right close to where you prune. Okay, now any question on that? Okay, then. Uh, I say uh, you'll see some people who may start to prune uh, a month afterwards, even though the frost hasn't come, but this becomes a real problem. You've had problems pruning when there are no leaves on there at all. You can imagine the difficulty of pruning with, a, with about two-thirds of the leaf surface still on the vine. So it's better to wait, and it's better to wait for several reasons. And these you ought to get down. Uh, a pruner should delay, if possible, pruning his grape vines. The longer he can delay, the better ch ch uh, chance he has to see whether or not the wood is mature. Because you should have noticed when you're out there pruning that after the first lab up to the third lab, we'd had uh, several weeks of cold weather, and it's quite easy to see which was the immature wood because of the cold weather effect on, on killing off that immature wood. So it makes it easier to select, especially with cane pruning, to select the good mature canes by waiting until you've had some cold weather to separate the sheep from the goats, so to speak. Okay, then the uh, next point, of course, on, on delay is one which we want to discuss in great detail here a little bit later, and that is to uh, gain protection against early spring frost. The longer you wait, the more chance you have of, of protection against early spring frost. Now, why is that? Well, I, I gave you, and one of the reasons why these principles of pruning are so important that I told you that on, on a cane now, this happens to be a cane out here, and these are the buds. I said that one of these minor principles of pruning is that the terminal buds start to grow first. And the moment a terminal bud on most plants starts to grow, it puts out some sort of growth inhibitor that in, progressively inhibits the, all the buds below it from beginning activity. So that if you wait as long as possible, even until these terminal buds begin to push out and, and maybe have an inch or so of growth on them, they're really keeping these basal buds, which you really want for your crop, repressed from starting any sort of growth activity. And if they're repressed from starting growth activity, they have tolerance against a little bit more, they have more, a little bit more resistance to cold, maybe two or three degrees more resistance to cold. So if you wanted to delay pruning right up until your vine was beginning to look a little green across the top of it, and then go out and do your pruning, you would have, uh, you'd gain maybe uh, a week or 10 days of cold protection on the two buds that you wanted to keep. 
but you can hardly wait if you've got 160 acres, you can hardly wait until they're starting to grow and then decide to prune because anything might happen. You might have a week of rainy weather. You might have a week, uh, two weeks of strikes by Chavez and company, or you might have trouble getting, uh, it might, you might have any sorts, all sorts of problems with pruning then. So what we suggest doing is double pruning. So in double pruning, we go through and prune every, every uh, prune the vines just as though we're going to leave them, but we leave something like six or eight buds on the canes. And if you leave, uh, certainly if you leave eight buds per cane, you get the same effect as though you had, uh, you get the same effect as though you had not pruned them at all and just made one pruning after the terminal started to grow. In other words, this eight buds out here, so right? this is spur pruning, yeah, of course, this is spur pruning, so that, that you, instead of leaving the corn back and pruning everything to two buds, you'll prune everything to six to eight buds. On, on every position you're going to leave. Clean up all the brush, get everything out, get all set. And then wait until these two or three buds begin to show signs of green <coughs> growth. And then you can go through very quickly and very rapidly because all the decisions have been made. The brush is out of the way. All you've got is 16 or 18 spurs and you know you're going through and cut every one of them off back to two buds. So you can go over the vineyard pretty fast under those conditions. <laughs> Would that affect the vine? Uh Badly also, would it depress the vine even more because it was pruned twice or not? Well, not if, not if you get this. His point is that I think what he's getting at is here, uh, would you get a weakening effect on the vine by doing this? You would if you let these shoots get out here like this. See, let... But in a big increase, but, how are you going to stop them from getting a, a lot Well, because effect. you're going to wait until you just see the first slight bit of green out here and then you're going to prune them all in one week and then knock them off, and you can do this pretty fast. You, can, you, can, you should be able to do this in a minute per vine or a half a minute per vine. After all, you, you don't have to make any decision. Just especially, you can just go click, 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 and cut off 16 cuts without worrying about it. All you have to do is be able to count to two. <laughs> That's the only decision you got. Now let's look, just to impress it on your mind, let's just show the one slide, Mark, and then we'll turn it right back on. It just shows that one, one vine double prune, see? Now this is so that it'll stick in your mind. See, there's a, vine a vine that has been double pruned for frost protection. And you see it's down to two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and about 15 spurs, and you just click them and cut them all off when these begin to swell at the end. <laughs> well, that's, that's the kind we don't like. To, this, is, this is a vertical head or a vertical cordon, essentially. But uh, you can see that out through here, what we try to tell you in class isn't what you find out in nature or out in the, in the great, great growing areas of California. You'll find all sorts of things. See, because, and that's why we pound it into you to try to do it right. But telling you how to do it isn't, doesn't mean that you're going to do it right. And if you go out and try as a school teacher or something and try to teach it to somebody else, all you can do is teach them the ideal. You can't make sure that the people they're going to work with are going to do it right. So this is double pruning for frost protection, and it will gain you about uh, ten, a week to 10 days delay in the bud push. Okay, next uh, No, not next slide, but lights, please. Okay, so this would be one, re again, another reason for delay in pruning, or at least uh, for this type of business of frost protection. Uh, and this should be done. I don't, we can't understand why growers are not willing to follow it. Uh, more commonly, especially in these coastal counties and even in the valley where there's spur prune varieties, uh, in low-lying spots and on that are subject frequently to frost, maybe even if you only get frost every 30 or 4th year. I don't see why the additional cost of this is going to be so great or why it wouldn't be advisable to do it. But we, we haven't been able to get uh, many growers to follow it, which is one of the cheapest and easiest ways to gain a little bit of frost protection. Other than that, uh, you can... Uh, we're going to get around to machines and so forth here in a moment, but first I want to get a, the plant business out of the way. The other, the other way that you might do for frost protection is to, if you're getting ready to plant a variety, is to give some thought to the nature of the variety you're planting and its growth habit. Now what I'm saying there is that we have quite a range among our common varieties or among our available varieties quite a range in the 
time at which the buds break and start to grow. All our grape varieties don't break out. Well, you can see it in the almonds if you drive down to the milk farm. So we can see that some of the almond trees already are in almost full bloom and others aren't even starting to bloom at all. And we have the same type of range in grapes. In fact, the range in grapes uh, covers nearly a month from the ones that start to grow earliest to the ones that grow latest. So you could give some thought to this. And I gave, uh, I gave this, Dr. Leiter has been working on this, uh, accumulating data on this now for about uh, four or five years. And uh, about once every three months I get on him why he doesn't publish it because it seems to me it's some of the most valuable information that people like you could have. And uh, I summarized some of it from his material and sent it to the Mexicans. So if I can send it to the Mexicans, I guess I can send it to you. So, uh, but the, among the varieties that he's checking out here, about 30 or 40 varieties, just to give you an idea, one of the, one of the earliest types that breaks is Gamay Beaujolais. Now this is early, early bud breaking. Gamay Beaujolais is one of the earliest that you might be interested in. <coughs> We go down to Queen, which is a table variety. And I'm just going to give you highlights here, the, uh, the ones which I think you might be interested in. Uh, French Columbar, uh, Semillon, Pinot Noir, and Salvador, all, which one you might not be interested in at all, Salvador, all break about the same time. Now these are relative break dates. I'm not giving you the exact dates, and it's only averages of years. It's just comparing one against the other. And here comes ruby red, and I'm skipping some of the ones which I don't think you'd be interested in at all. This is what they wanted down there for. And then we come into white Riesling. Uh, uh, from early to late in relative ranking. Then you got uh, ruby Cabernet. And uh, Cabernet, some of you can't see when I get down this low. All right, let me, take, let me continue this up here. You've got this, so let me erase it, okay? Then we're continuing this, so, so this is just continued up here. Then we get to Cabernet. And to Valdepinas. And the latest of the group that he has which be of some interest to some of you, is this, is uh, St. Emilion, which I just put on the board over here for this early fall business. St. Emilion, then, is the latest. This is Uni, Uni Blanc, or Trebbiano, as it's called up, perhaps, in, in Italy. And I'll put one more in here, which I should have put in. After the, or you need Thompson Seedless in here. Thompson Seedless comes in here. Thompson Seedless comes in at this point, and Cardinal comes in here. Most of you are interested in wine grapes, and I've been brainwashed by you by two years or so now, so I sort of leave out the table grapes. But Cardinal and Thompson come in here just ahead of French Columbar, Semillon, Pinot Noir, and so on, from early to late. So you have this business of double pruning that gives you a couple of days leeway. Uh, if you're trying to choose between just a choice of one or two varieties, say for example, white Riesling here versus Pinot Noir, which was sitting right here, might save you uh, uh, three or four days or a week's time. When Leiter gets around to publishing this, it'll be very useful because he'll certainly should give the, the intervals between these. These intervals cover from, from earliest here, from Gamay Beaujolais to Unit Blanc, cover about three or four weeks. So as you can assume that these are about three or four days apart in the time at which they bud break. So you've gained a week or 10 days by double pruning. By a judicious choice of a variety, you can gain yourself another three or four days. That's my point I'm trying to make. OK, now aside from that, uh, we have this whole matter of frost. and. Uh, I want to discuss what, what uh, the frost injury means to grape vines and then give you this matter of uh, frost prevention and so on. Um, perhaps the first thing we ought to do to just, rather than draw you pictures and talk about it, is, is use the slides to just show you what frost injury is. So let's just finish it out on slides. <clears throat> this was a frost taken 
um, several, these are Frost pictures from several years, but uh, uh, most of these, I'll get to them in a moment here, are Frost of 1970. Now, uh, you can have a frost which just affects this growth out here at the tips, but doesn't get down low enough to hurt your clusters, and you're not hurt too bad. It may look bad, but you haven't hurt much. You just stop the growth for a little while, but it's just like you'd gone out and tipped them to prevent wind injury or something like this. So you just, so if it just, if it just gets out here on the tips, you're not hurt. But that's what we call a mild frost. But if you get a moderate frost, which is really the worst type, under our definitions of a moderate frost, a moderate frost is one that doesn't kill clear back to the base, but kills back far enough to get the clusters. And that's the worst kind. It's not mountain grown, but it's the worst kind. <laughs> uh, the worst kind of frost that you can get is to get one that just kills back and kills the clusters, but doesn't kill to the base. Because if you kill the clusters, of course, you've lost the uh, crop off that shoot. But if you don't kill it clear to the base, you just get lateral growth coming out of the base down here with no fruit on it. If you get just a mile when it gets the tips, you haven't hurt your crop, so you're all right. So I'll, I'll illustrate that a little later in, on the board. Go ahead to the next slide. Now this gives you, I'm just going to show you some examples of frost. If you could uh, sharpen some of those, Mark, they, uh, yeah. Uh, this is some frost pictures that uh, Dr. Cleaver himself was one that took most of the next uh, half a dozen or so. And you can see, one of the things about frost is that it's spotty in nature. It doesn't cover things just uniformly, and it acts very erratically in screwball. Because sometimes you can get one, one shoot on one side that gets frosted, and that's all. Sometimes you can get a, a half a vine frosted, sometimes you get a, a six or eight vines in a location frosted. Uh, one ten percent to uh, complete frost, and then other vines uh, get missed. So it's sort of a uh, erratic uh, uh, damage to the vine. Okay, next slide. <coughs> now you see this is the worst kind of frost because it's killed the clusters completely. And you can some people sometimes want to know, well, how do you know? How soon can you tell whether or not you've had frost? Well, if we had these shoots out and they, and uh, we had the frost last night. Certainly by this afternoon, they begin to show some blackening, and certainly by tomorrow morning, they would show blackening. So uh, certainly you can see the effect of whether or not your vines got frosted within the same day or within 24 hours. The next slide. Now here's a vine that is, see, is pretty well killed. Now you say, well, that looks pretty terrible. Actually, that isn't as bad for you as the previous two slides were, because these are killed back to the base bud, and there's not much you have to do about it except uh, uh, wait till that stuff dries up and the new shoots come out. Remember, remember what I'm getting at here is that in most of these great buds, you've got three growing points. And under normal conditions, only the primary growing point grows. But if you kill everything right smack uh, back to the base bud or base position, then one of those uh, secondary or tertiary buds will start to grow. Next slide. Our time's up, but let's see if we can get this series out of the way. Now this is uh, some of the effect of, I was telling you about some of the growers decided on two-wire vert uh, vertical for Thompson seedless that uh, they found out that in low places, the ones that came up on the high wire were okay, but the ones on the low wires got frosted. And you can see in here that most of these uh, low ones in here got frosted, but there's very little damage to those way up there on top. That's part of that basis for putting everything up on a higher wire. Also, wait a minute, also I will tell you uh, next lecture that cover crop uh, tends to uh, increase the danger from frost, to increase the danger from frost. So along with all those other terrible things I said about how useless cover crop is in California vineyards, another thing you have to add to it is that cover crop increases your frost danger by about two or three degrees compared to a clean soil. Now see the next slide and then we'll have to quit. See here's a young vineyard, especially young vines with a cover crop like that, and even though it's a natural cover crop, you can see they were killed. This is all on the same day we were taking pictures. They were killed, every shoot, everything on the whole plant was killed back. They had everything against them. Uh, no protection and this, this high cover crop. So we'll pick up at that point next time. <laughs>